In March 1958, after three years of construction, the New Zealand Temple of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was completed. Just a few kilometres south of Hamilton, it sat on a hill overlooking the Church College of New Zealand, which had also just been finished. It was an impressive building with over 4,100 square metres of floor space, one ordinance room, three ceiling rooms, a baptistry and a spire that rose 48 metres in the air. It was the first Latter-day Saint temple built in the Southern Hemisphere and only the second outside of the United States and Canada. This ambitious construction project was notable and during the open house over 112,000 people flocked to see this new addition to the New Zealand religious landscape. But behind the scenes was something far more notable. In spite of the labour and material shortages of post-World War II, both school and temple were built almost entirely by a volunteer workforce. Hundreds of labour missionaries that were called to consecrate their time and talents and sustained by the offerings of local members. This is the story of the young men, young women, and entire families who sacrificed personal gain and comfort to build a school for their children and a temple to their God. Such a thing had never happened before and has not happened since. The roots of this story trace back to a time before the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints arrived on the shores of New Zealand. It goes back to the early 1800s and the Māori tohunga, holy men who prophesied to their people of a new Christian church that would arrive on their shores. Māori have always had a strong tradition of faith and spirituality, but with the arrival of competing Christian sects in the early 1800s, many asked their spiritual leaders which faith was right for them. Several tohunga sought divine guidance on the matter and shared their answers. In 1830, Arama Toirua of Mahia told his people to watch for messengers from across the great ocean who would come to present-day Wellington and would stand and pray with both hands raised to heaven. In 1845, Toirua Pakahia, another tohunga, gave a similar message. In 1877, Apiata Kuikainga, ancestor of church leader Stuart Meha, predicted that a new faith would teach salvation for the dead. In 1879, King Tafia of the Waikato prophesied the messages of the true church would not live in Pākehā accommodations, but live among them, eat their food, speak their language, and travel in twos. In 1881, Paura Putangaroa was asked the same question by his people. After three days of fasting and prayer, he appeared before his people and spoke prophetically as others had before him. You will recognize it when it comes, he said. Its missionaries will travel in pairs. They will come from the rising sun. They will visit with us in our homes. They will learn our language and teach us the gospel in our own tongue. When they pray, they will raise their right hands. You will learn of the scepter of Judah of the kingdom of heaven and of the sacred church with a large wall surrounding it. Putangaroa died a few months later. The next year, unaware of these prophecies, missionaries from the United States in the east travelled from Wellington to many Māori villages. They travelled in pairs, lived among the Māori people, ate their food and learned their language. They taught the gospel of the kingdom of heaven including salvation for the dead and the blessings of the temple, like the one in Salt Lake City, surrounded by a large wall. And when they ended their public meetings, they raised their hands in prayer to bless the people. For many, this was a fulfilment of the prophecies. And over the next few years, thousands of Māori would join the church. By the turn of the century, there were over 4,000 church members in New Zealand, and 90% of them were Māori. With such a large church population gathered in one area, the temporal needs of its members became a concern for its leaders. They saw that educational opportunities for young Māori men were limited, which made it difficult to raise a family. In 1913, 
Drawing on both member and headquarters support, the church completed construction of the Māori Agricultural College near Hastings. Its purpose was to give the rising generation vocational and religious training and help them develop leadership skills. The MAC, as it was affectionately called, started out with great promise. When Apostle David O'McKay visited the school in 1921, he asked members of the school board to find a location where another school for young women could be built as well. But by 1930, enrolment had dropped and the school was struggling to keep its doors open. In addition, the church had recently decided to withdraw from regional education projects such as this one, and it was announced that the MAC would be closed. Then disaster struck. On February 3rd, 1931, a few months after the announcement, an earthquake hit the Hawke's Bay area so hard that the seismograph at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City recorded the event. Though no one at the MAC was injured, the buildings were too badly damaged to be salvaged. There was no going back. And yet, in a way, the school would live on. On September 3, 1939, New Zealand joined the other Commonwealth countries and declared war on Germany. Foreign missionaries were called home, except for their mission president, Matthew J. Cowley. It was the practice at the time, when church membership was new and inexperienced, that missionaries and mission presidents would often fill key church leadership positions. With no missionaries to choose from, President Cowley called local members to fill the vacated positions. As the war years dragged on, he noted that the men who had attended the old Māori Agricultural College were the ones who were both willing and capable leaders. The benefits of having a church membership with a good education and the ability to take on leadership roles became clear, and President Cowley proposed another school be built. After the war, Matthew Cowley was called as an apostle, and in September of 1948, the First Presidency announced another school would be built in New Zealand. It was to be centrally located, accredited, open not just to Māori, but anyone who wished to attend. And to make good on the proposed school for girls that never came into being, it was co-educational as well. In post-war New Zealand, new cars were very rare. So when a real estate agent in Hamilton saw Mission President Gordon C. Young pull up in front of his office in a big Mercury sedan, he knew he wanted a ride in that car. President Young was the great-grandson of Brigham Young and had been given the assignment to find a location for the new campus by President George Albert Smith. The real estate agent didn't have any suitable land for sale, but he did know a farmer who was looking for a trade. President Young did not have any land to trade, but pressed to the agent who did want a ride in that car. So together they drove south to Bert Meldrum's farm. In later years, President Young often testified that when they pulled up to the property, he could envision the white school building standing upon it. After some negotiation, a deal was struck and the church obtained the site. One of the American missionaries who had to leave New Zealand in 1940 due to World War II was Elder George Biesinger. Watching the church grow as he served, he could see the need for more meeting houses throughout the country. Elder Biesinger had worked in construction before his mission and planned to return to that business when he got home. As he was leaving New Zealand, he told President Cowley, when you're ready to start building, I'm your man. Matthew Cowley didn't forget that young elder, and 10 years later, George Biesinger, now an experienced builder, was hired as supervisor of church construction in the South Pacific. He and his family arrived in New Zealand in April 1950. Meanwhile, church architect Edward Anderson drew up plans for the new school using California building standards that resisted the effects of earthquakes. Hopefully, there would be no repeat of the MAC's destruction. The massive amount of materials needed for such a huge project was just not available in a country recovering from the effects of war. So the church looked for creative ways to meet its own needs. A sawmill and a piece of timberland near Kaikohe were purchased to provide the lumber. A quarry at Farfada was obtained to supply the rock that would be crushed for concrete. A block-making machine shipped from California 
was installed into a plant where the millions of bricks could be made. Next came the joinery, where windows, doors and other wood components were manufactured. With the supply chains in place, construction began with a small crew of full-time workers. But it quickly became apparent that it would be impossible to hire enough skilled labourers to build such a massive project. As leadership considered the problem, discussions turned to a programme that was used to build meeting houses in Tonga. But its success rested on being able to recruit a volunteer workforce who could learn on the job. It was decided to bring it up with the local membership. As long as the church had been established in New Zealand, one of the highlights of the year was going to Huito. This annual regional conference was a major cultural and religious event that lasted for several days. Mission President Sidney J. Otley and James Alkington, who had worked on the Tonga construction projects, took an entire conference session of the 1952 Huito to explain the volunteer building program. Workmen would be set apart as labour missionaries, but the local church branches would need to supply food, clothing and money to support them. The proposition was put to a vote. The assembly gave their unanimous support to the project. From that huito, a call had been sent out and its effect was far-reaching. All our hands went up enthusiastically, including mine, and at that time, for some reason or another, I don't know why or if it was just me, but I received a, what I didn't know then was a burning of the bosom. It was a spiritual witness that uh, sort of started at the head and went right down to the tips of my toes. It was a wonderful feeling. My mother, she had no hesitation in, in knowing that this is where I was going to be coming. Uh, and I thought I was going to have another year at, at high school, but she said, no, you better get up there and get on that and start serving on a, on a labour mission. And so I came up with the encouragement from my mother with a stick in one hand, you know, and saying, that's where you're going to go. The number of volunteers grew and the workforce was organised. Church headquarters called missionaries with construction skills from the United States to lead and train the teams of young labour missionaries. There was a transportation crew, a plumbing crew and a painting crew. The joiners did the carpentry work, the brookies did the masonry work and the sparkies did the electrical wiring. Young women were called to work in the construction offices. He put me in the plumbing crew and uh, I've never regretted it because Ollie Evans, he went to see the New Zealand government <clears throat> and he said, look, we've got these young men here working and we're teaching them a trade. In fact, he set up the apprenticeship program where I was able to serve my apprenticeship while I was serving as a building mission. And that prepared me for after we finished and the project was completed. Most of us that worked here at the college on the project we developed a trade for ourselves that took a lot of us through life, where we could support our families. It became my trade. Living conditions at the construction site for the workers were very basic. The single men shared bunk houses, while families were assigned small huts known as batches. The boys, we used to call their accommodation chicken coops. But that's just what they were like. They had wire netting for windows. And, and the married couples who lived in the little batches that are no larger than a three-bedroom lounge, and they had a bedroom and a kitchen in it. Those were the ones that sacrificed and gave up their time and, and their homes to come here and build a college. My husband's mother especially thought we were terrible taking our family to a place like this, bringing them up with no facilities or anything, because you know, we had to go walk down the road to the bathroom and toilets and go and have a shower down there. We didn't have any of that uh, in our little batch. <laughs> so some of our families were really quite upset to think we'd come over here. And like, even though our families thought we were crazy, we tended to do what we could to be good members once we arrived here. 
and with the help of all the people, and that's what it was. It's just the community spirit was the thing that's kept us all together, I think. We did things together and everybody helped each other and you know, it really was like a Zion place for us. Hundreds of meals were prepared each day by the kitchen staff and fed to the crew in Kai Hall. Since food was provided through donations from the district members, sometimes the cooks had very little to work with. Raiha Te Ngaio was the lead cook, but everyone called her Nanny Raiha, and she was legendary. Nanny Raiha. Many of us as labour missionaries, those who came as married couples later on, all called her the old battle axe. But you know, she loved us. We'd say, hey, this is the same soup we got yesterday, Nanny. And she'd say, oh, no, it isn't. I just had added a little bit more water. And so it's not, it was just thinner. So we had a saying in the Kai Hall, if we got the same soup, we'd say, SOS, same old soup. Well, I suppose she would have been 60 plus at the time, but she worked and provided us with food. And at times, okay, we may have said it was the same old soup, but so what? It kept us going. And that's what we need to be thankful for. And I'm sure every one of us that was dependent on that meal that she provided would give thanks and appreciate Nanny Raiha for what she was. There were people in the districts throughout New Zealand that used to send us food. And uh, it must have been equally as taxing for them. You know, there's an army of people. But I remember one time that still is vivid in my mind, even to this day, is that we started to run out of food. And we were called off the job. And Elder B. Singer told us of our plight and situation that he said that we were to fast. He says, we're going to fast. The whistle will go at the end of study class and you will say your prayers after study class and go to work. 12 o'clock, it will ring again and you will all assemble in the joinery factory and we knelt in prayer. And then at five o'clock, that whistle went again. And we assembled in the joinery factory. I heard this noise, and being a curious person, I looked out the window, and there were the trucks rolling in from Hawke's Bay, Hauraki, East Coast, Gisborne, and Hastings, of course, loaded with produce and tins of fruit and and what have you, which uh, testified to me that if you have faith, things will come right as long as you put the Lord first. And I'll never forget that feeling I had in that as we knelt in prayer. I will never remember who said the prayer. I'll never forget the feeling I had as that prayer was being said. Each week, the missionaries received a small live-in allowance for personal items. It wasn't much. Yet despite the low pay, difficulty of the work and the challenges of the living conditions, spirits were high. When we first started, remuneration wasn't much. When I first started, it was two pounds a week. After about a year of that, we were one pound a week. Then another year after that, we got down to 10 shillings a week. We thought, oh, well, this is all right. We were getting three meals a day. Sometimes it was just pippy soup or, you know, whatever was available. When I look back, you know, people say that it was a sacrifice for us to come here and, and serve on a building mission. To me, it wasn't. It was a blessing and an honor to serve as a building missionary because Every week we got our money, and uh, every week we had some place to stay. Every day we had three meals a day, 
in the, sometimes you might have gotten four meals if you went to someone who had some extra food in his room. At first, the work went slowly. The land was largely a peat bog and the constant rain made it worse. The crew was challenged in many ways. We encountered very rough times. Those are the times when it took a long while for us to get out of the swamp. We worked in mud up to our knees, but that all came with part of the work that we were called to do. It was a lot of fun, a lot of trials. Things weren't as easy as they were later. There were times when the weather was wet and cold. We had little to eat, little to wear, but the elements didn't affect us as much. I think because of the burning testimony we had at time, the work which we're doing was a work of our Heavenly Father. One particular day it was raining and we were in the trench and to give you an idea as to the mindset we were at, we all started to sing Master the Tempest is Raging, you know, and they were splashing around there and throwing shovels of mostly water and slush out of the footing. And then John Smith came to the edge and he noticed that, you know, the tempo was so slow and he said, Boy, this is going to take forever. So John Smith hopped into the footing with us and instead of Master, the tempest is raging, he started to sing, Master, the tempest is raging. The <laughs> and we thought, whoa. So, like, we, he turned what would to others seem a negative. To us, it was a positive. You know, who else would uh, work under these conditions? Only us because it was for the church. Construction work by its very nature can be dangerous, but as time went on, it seemed that this project was being watched over in a special way. In the early days of the church, uh, the small batches for married couples down there and under the trees, they had a small cooker, which two burners on it, electrical cooker, which uh, everybody turned on to heat. <laughs> And eventually, because of the load in the, at the college, the, one of the fuses or two of the fuses would blow. Uh, and uh, I would have to go up and, and fix them. Now, there was a, a concrete floor in this uh, three by three uh, building. It was been an inch of water in the bottom, <laughs> always in the bottom of that. There was no light in there. And, uh, the way I would fix, uh, determine which fuse was blown, I would uh, put my hand on one of the big iron-clad fuses and I could feel the heat. If one was cold, I'd know that that one was blown. And in this case, I went to touch the other one and my hand was thrown back against the back of the door. I knew that something was wrong. I didn't touch the wire, but somebody, something threw my hand against the back door. And I went to Sister B. Singer and I said, can I borrow a torch? <laughs> she said, yes. So I went out with the flashlight and uh, put it on there, and the wire was so hot that it burnt the rubber off of the wire, and it was bare, bare wire. If I had to put my hand around that like I did the others, I'd have been dead. One of the experiences that I really appreciated learning about was fasting and praying for someone else who was sick. Sister Charles was advised to return home to the States because she had cancer. And this was a new experience for me to fast for two days that uh, she will be made well. And the doctors said, there's nothing we can do with you to take her home. And so they were sent home. We fasted and we prayed here on the college for Sister Charles. When they got home and examined, the doctors couldn't find anything wrong with her, and she was sent back to finish their mission. And I saw her, I met her in 1981 when we went on tour, and I said to Sister Charles, do you remember when the labor missionaries fasted for you? And she said, how can I ever forget? I'm here, aren't I?
Besides taking care of their families, the married women living in camp were also recruited into support groups, helping with kitchen work, gardening and sick bay duties. And when the site became overrun with visitors, they also became tour guides. And in addition to all this, they filled yet another assignment, that of being a camp mother. And the mothers and the sisters in the camp and some of the American sisters, they took care of a lot of the single boys' clothing. They were assigned to be our mothers and they washed our clothes and, and kept us looking decent. The four boys that I was had for the two years that I was here was Kami Hammond, who worked in the joinery crew, Castle Kopua, who also worked in the joinery crew. Wally Josephs, who worked for the Sparkies, and Bill Gudgeon. We had three washing machines and one huge dryer. And if you were smart, you would get up at six o'clock, wash your clothes and dry them before the rush started, which started about eight o'clock. Here we are, what, 50 years later. And you find out the woman that was washing your clothes and, uh, and she still loves us and I still love her. So I think all of the missionaries, the young men, feel the same way about the mothers that took care of them. By 1953, seven married couples with 20 children lived in the married quarters and 83 men in the barracks. Although their quarters were temporary, this group would eventually become the foundation of the Temple View community, some spending their entire lives there. But the sense of community went beyond the geographic gathering of a group of people. When trials or tragedies struck, they were there for each other. When our baby was very sick, they sent me home to recuperate while she was still in hospital. And I wasn't home for very long, and the police came to tell me that my baby had passed away. So we brought her back here to the to Temple View, and the day of her funeral, we didn't want to take her home to Gisborne to to be buried. We never had any money, and during the day of the funeral, everyone that shook our hand. Even our labor missionaries shook our hands and left money in our hands and we had enough money to go on to take her to be buried in Manitouka and that is where she, she lies today. I'm very, very grateful and thankful for the labor missionary program because the blessings we have received from that have been wonderful, really wonderful. But back at church headquarters, there was growing concern about the project. Financial support from some of the districts lagged, and there were also serious cost overruns on the construction. It was suggested that perhaps it would be necessary to cut back on some of the plans. About this time, Elder Biesinger happened to meet Wendell B. Mendenhall, a prominent businessman and stake president from California who had served in New Zealand as a missionary and had returned to visit. He had extensive experience working with construction contractors and was intrigued by this unique project. The two men headed off immediately. Before leaving, President Mendenhall offered to do anything he could to help after he got back home. He was also a friend of David O. McKay, and when it was announced a year later that President and Sister McKay were going to tour the Pacific, President Mendenhall volunteered to accompany them at his own expense. The response was not what he expected. Although it had not been publicly announced, church leadership had approved the construction of a temple somewhere in the South Pacific. It was also decided that President McKay himself would choose the location during his two-month tour of Fiji, Tonga, Samoa, American Samoa, Tahiti, Australia and New Zealand. 
Instead of accompanying the Mackays, President Mendenhall was asked to take a different, confidential assignment. He was to travel to New Zealand, perform an audit of the expenditures of the school project, and while he was there, find a location he could recommend as a potential temple site. After several days of travelling across the country, he had identified several possible spots, but he felt he should visit the school construction site one more time. He later recorded his experience. While in the car on the way, the whole thing came to me in an instant. The temple should be there by the college. The church facilities for construction were already there, and that was the centre of the population of the mission. Then in my mind, I could see the area even before I arrived, and I could envision the hill where the temple should stand. As soon as I arrived at the college and drove over the top of the hill, my whole vision was confirmed. In my heart, I felt that the Lord had especially made this hill for His temple. Everything about it was so majestic and beautiful. But President Mendenhall did not have a chance to mention his impression to anyone. And when President Mackay arrived to inspect the school construction, he was travelling with three other brethren, and the subject did not come up. They drove to the same spot where President Mendenhall had stood. As President Mackay got out of the car, he took President Mendenhall by the arm and pulled him some distance from the rest of the party, turned to him and said, What do you think? President Mendenhall knew what he meant, but simply replied, What do you think? President McKay said, this is the place where the temple should be. While no official approval or announcement was to be made until after he consulted with the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, President McKay instructed President Mendenhall to buy the land. The hill was an ideal location, sitting between the school campus and some farmland that both belonged to the church. However, ownership of the new property was complicated. It was split between five members of the Murray family, the mother, three brothers and a sister. All five had indicated they did not want to sell, but privately, President McKay assured President Mendenhall they would. The day after President McKay left, President Mendenhall met with the family again, and one by one they each agreed to sell. By 5.30 that afternoon, the papers were all signed. Shortly after, Wendell Mendenhall was called to chair the Worldwide Church Building Committee. The 1955 Huito was held at the college construction site. It was here that Elder Biesinger announced that a temple would be built on the hill above them using the Labour Missionary Programme. About 4,000 members were in attendance, and they gave the project a unanimous, sustaining vote. It was also announced that the school project would not be cut back as previously feared, but instead was to be expanded. Two new buildings were added, one for the administrative offices, which would become the Matthew Cowley Building, and another containing an auditorium, gymnasium and swimming pool, which was named the David O. McKay Building. Elder Biesinger, President Mendenhall, and newly called Mission President, Ariel Balliff, broke ground December 21st, 1955. About 600 people attended, and immediately afterwards, heavy equipment moved in to start the excavation. When construction on the temple started, there were 14 American tradesmen and 150 labor missionaries on the site. That number grew to 36 craftsmen and over 200 missionaries. Likewise, there was growth in the construction village as well, as engagements, weddings and births became part of their little community, their numbers grew to 235 people. The first pour for the temple foundations took place in January 1956 and by June, the temple walls were visible from Hamilton. As the construction became more visible, so did interest in the project. Sightseers would come visit in large numbers. During one weekend in October 1956, over 600 visitors arrived. A year later, those numbers would grow to exceed 4,000. 
proselyting missionaries acted as guides during the week, but on weekends, the women from the project took over. Up to 40 guides worked each Sunday to explain the project and, if possible, share their testimonies of the restored gospel. By January 1957, the temple walls had reached the third story. As the temple started taking on its final form, those who worked on the project began to feel an increased reverence for what they were building. Joe Apiti, one of the workers, recalled, At the earlier stages of building the temple, all the orders were being shouted. The closer it got to completion time, the quieter and more reverent everybody got. Pretty soon they were talking in whispers, and it was so amazing. Everybody was whispering and talking in low tones because the house of the Lord was nearly completed, and they honoured that. As the temple neared completion, the open house and dedication dates were announced, but there was still much to do. We used to have a sign down by the construction office there, so many days to dedication, and we kind of had to work well into the night on some of these jobs. The Relief Society would bring us up something to eat about nine, ten o'clock, we would scoff all that down and proceed on further to have the building finished for President McKay when he came back to dedicate the whole project. But even as the crews pressed on, opposition struck in the form of bad weather. Torrential rain washed away landscaping and created major setbacks. In response, members rallied from all over the district, giving up weekends and holidays for the final push. The workforce grew to over 400. Dyke Walton, who worked in the church's building office in Australia, recalled the dedication of the workers. I saw men catching a few winks of sleep on the floor. Work was going on around the clock to finish. One young boy, a trowel next to him, lay awake on the floor. He looked up at me with a smile when I asked, when was the last time you slept in your bed, son? And he pondered my question with heavy eyelids. I don't remember, he said finally. Can't you take time for a few hours' sleep? He got to his feet and said, We said we'll be ready by tomorrow, and we will. We have all been working like this for several weeks now. The great thing about the temple was the night they floodlit it to test the lighting out. And they said to us, if you want to see the lights, come on, come up in front of the visitor centre and uh, we'll switch them on for you. So we all went up there and the visitors front, down on the front road, they threw the switch on all these outside lights. Of course, these big mercury vapor lamps come on very slowly and they sort of heat up. And it was like a, like a vision taking place. Here's this building coming out of the darkness as these lights came on stronger. And, and there it was. What a beautiful sight. Here was this magnificent building sitting there on top of the hill, all by itself, no trees, no vegetation, just nothing, just raw beauty. And, and uh, I tell you, the spirit was so strong that people were crying. In fact, I almost cried myself. But I'm being big father bear, <laughs> I gotta be tough. But I, I still had to touch my heart to see this building. And, and, and what it meant to us all. It, it was tremendous. Finally, after three long years, and in spite of floods and dark of night, the temple was completed right on schedule. And as the doors opened to the public, the building and grounds were flooded again, but this time, with thousands of people from all over the Pacific area that wanted to see this beautiful house of the Lord. Over 112,000 people filed through the seven-storey, 75-room temple during the 23 days of the open house, a number roughly three times the population of nearby Hamilton. When President McKay arrived a few days later, 6,000 members from across the Pacific area were there to welcome him and attend the dedication ceremonies. Kia ora. Kia ora. lava. Malo lele. 
and everybody, thank you. Welcoming speeches were followed by three and a half hours of traditional dances and presentations of the Pacific Island cultures. It was indeed a time of celebration. For Latter-day Saints, to have access to a temple is to have access to the choicest blessings of heaven. It is where individuals can be blessed with the sustaining power of heaven, and families can be joined together, not just in this life, but for the next life as well. But at this point in time, there were only 10 temples in existence, and getting to one often meant days of travel across long distances. Some have recounted tales of selling everything in order to pay for the trip of a lifetime. For others, it was just an impossible dream. This temple in the South Pacific now brought that dream within the reach of many. The New Zealand temple was dedicated in six sessions on Sunday, April 20th, 1958, with President McKay reading the dedicatory prayer. As part of that prayer, he made special mention of the labour missionaries. We invoke thy blessing particularly upon the men and women who have so willingly and generously contributed their means, time and effort to the completion of this imposing and impressive structure. Especially we mention all those who have accepted calls as labour missionaries and literally consecrated their all upon the altar of service. May each contributor be comforted in spirit and prospered manyfold. May they be assured that they have the gratitude of thousands, perhaps millions, on the other side for whom the prison doors may now be opened and deliverance proclaimed to those who will accept the truth and be set free. During the dedication, it was discovered that some members who had made this once-in-a-lifetime trip had hoped to receive their temple ordinances immediately after the dedication. But after a temple is dedicated, it is usually closed for several days to be cleaned and readied for use. For those whose travel schedules could not be changed, there was little hope of receiving temple ordinances before they had to leave. With permission from church leadership, the labour missionaries stepped in again. They cleaned and prepared the temple in a matter of hours and then, acting as ordinance workers, laboured through the night to allow those who could not stay the opportunity for temple blessings. It would be perhaps their last great service and sacrifice as labour missionaries. The following Thursday, President McKay also dedicated the church college. The services were attended by dignitaries including the Prime Minister and Governor-General of New Zealand, members of the Royal Family of Tonga and other government and educational leaders. Then the following evening, in an emotional meeting with church leadership, the 185 remaining Labour missionaries, some who had served for years, were released. The motto of the Church College of New Zealand was build now for eternity. But perhaps no one understood that principle better than the Labour missionaries who built it. They sacrificed their time, comfort and material gains in order to build a school and a temple that would benefit others for generations to come. In 2009, after more than 50 years of operation, the Church College of New Zealand closed its doors. And like the Māori Agricultural College before it, took its place in history as another great chapter in the quest of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to bless the lives of its members, neighbours and friends. And though the school may be gone, what the Labour missionaries built still lives on. It lives on in the hearts and minds of those educated in the school they built. It lives on in the blessings of ordinances given in the temple they built and it lives on in their example. An inspirational monument built of faith, sacrifice and dedication, given freely for the good of others. I was asked how I felt at the time that we got the call to go on a labour mission. And I felt that this was an answer to many a prayer and a dream come true 
because our parents, grandparents and great-grandparents had prayed for this day for many, many years when we could have our own chapels, our own school and our own temple. So this was our parents' dream. This was our grandparents and this was our great-grandparents' dream. And so to become a part of this program, to help this dream become a reality for us all, was just such a privilege and a blessing in our lives. Because this program not only built buildings, we found out, but it built people, good people.